Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. So help yourself to the food. Feel free to refill your place. And um, I'm Teresa Bevel, and I'm the chair of the Diversity Council. It is my absolute honor and a great privilege to welcome you all to the celebration of the World Day of Cultural Diversity here at Providence Regional Medical Center, Everett. Again, thank you for coming. The event today was planned by the Northwest Diversity Council, and I'm so grateful to be the facilitator of this event. So why are we here today? We are together to celebrate the World Day for Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development, established in 2001. It is a day set aside by the United Nations as an opportunity for people to deepen our understanding of the values of cultural diversity and to learn to live together in harmony. What we would really like here at Providence Red Regional Medical Center is to encourage everyone to get to know each other and even the patients that we serve and to build a sense of a strong community. Rather than focusing on what makes us diverse, we would like to focus on how we can come together to find common values and build stronger bonds. We look out for how we can take diversity as inclusion to the next level, to honor and nurture our sense of common humanity and make Providence Hospital and the clinics a dynamic place to work. To make today special for you, because this is all about you, we have invited two professionals from the Racial Equity Consultants Group to present about understanding of race and racism in healthcare. How to appreciate and recognize these differences to build lasting relationships. Please join me in welcoming and wishing a special thank you to Marlon Brown and Fran Patrick for being here today. And please don't forget to help yourself to complimentary food, which you have done so already, from around the world, including food from Asia, India, Mexico, and Italy. Also, special thanks goes to Mesida and Chef Frank and his team for the appetizers and refreshments. And I also personally want to thank um, Carla. Carla, where are you? Thank you, Carla, for organizing the evaluations, which we are going to have at the end. And a big thank you to Wendy and Kevin. Please, let's clap for them. For the photography, live video, and technology support. We really appreciate you. Last but not the least, Special thank you goes to the Diversity Council members. Please stand up if you're, any of the members are here. Just on your feet for, thank you so much. <laughs> Everything you see here is because of their hard work. The Diversity Council meets every two months, once every two months and we serve as an organizing body for discussions, planning of events, connecting with our internal and external communities and celebrations related to diversity here at Providence Everett. During the time for the audience reflection and evaluation by Carla at the end, um, please sign your name if you're interested in joining the Diversity Council and being a member. Also, we'd like to hear about the 2020 celebration. I can't believe it's 2020 next year. Wow. Um, let us know your thoughts. Please share any topics or recommendations you would like for next year's Diversity Day celebration. Then at your tables, we have members scattered all over the diversity members who will help you. And we appreciate your feedback, so do fill out 
the evaluation forms. Again, thank you all for coming, your support and attendance. We really appreciate it. Please sit and relax and enjoy this event that we've planned for you. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to call on Barry Stube, our Director for Mission Integration and Spiritual Care, to give us a reflection. Thank you, Teresa, and thank you also to Teresa for her hard work in pulling all of these elements together. Um, she had on the schedule that people would be here and have lunch and be seated by 11.35, and I thought, that's never going to happen, but you're all right on schedule, so we'll keep this, uh, the wealth of this hour uh, and the density uh, moving forward. Uh, we talk about diversity. We talk about, uh, the root of that word is how, how people are on divergent paths, and we're in, uh, often, even though we have a common humanity that we carry, we live in that tension of how we're different, even as we are uh, similar and and uh, united with each other and uh, there's been different ways that we've uh, talked about that over time uh, not too long ago we talked about the, the word tolerance was sometimes used about how we reflect on people who are different from us and then we've gone more to talking about things like acceptance and then now it's more like inclusion we keep coming a little bit closer together in our, in our awareness about how we um, how we relate to each other when there's when there's differences and um, we're going to be talking more about that today with, with uh, Fran and Marlon about how we, uh, how we live that out in a, in a uh, more and more complete way. Uh, but this really dives into our mission and values uh, as well as, as we think about how we live in diversity. Uh, uh, when we uh, uh, tap into our, our mission statement, we remember that we are expressions of God's healing love. And uh, that's, that's underneath our, our way of uh, connecting with each other, our way of seeing each other. Um, you know, we can talk about those different levels of how we come across that tension of being different, but at the root of it is really uh, loving each other. And uh, that's um, uh, what, what our, our mission calls us to do. And that's a unique thing about uh, how, we, uh, how we function and how we um, identify ourselves in, in our mission in, in Catholic healthcare. In, um, in Louisville, Kentucky, there's a historical marker, and usually those are, are setting out things about um, something that's happened there, a conflict that's happened there, a historic event, a political event. But in, in Louisville, there's a marker for a person's moment of revelation. Uh, Thomas Merton was a uh, person who followed a monastic life in, in that area, and he gives this account that in Louisville, at the corner of Fourth and Walnut in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. There is no way of telling people that they are all walking around shining like the sun. He had a transformation in the way that he saw the people around him that he didn't even know. And uh, Thomas Burton has been uh, somebody who's been an inspiration to many people in our culture about how to relate across that that sense of difference and uh, just our, our human uh, challenges in uh, relating to other people. Um, when we think about our core value of dignity, uh, we remember that uh, all of us have that common humanity that we relate to and that we respect the inherent worth of every person. And I think Thomas Burton was, was seeing that in his moment of revelation. And um, we recognize that each interaction is a sacred encounter, that we have in that moment when we're together an opportunity uh, to um, throw light and to recognize that, that glowing nature of each other's uh, dignity. And uh, Thomas Burton had another way of, of saying, tying that love together with the way that we seek dignity in other people, he said, the beginning of love is to let those we love be perfectly themselves and not to twist them to fit our own image. Otherwise, we love only the reflection of ourselves that we find in them. So Thomas Merton, I think, is encouraging us toward curiosity, toward uh, listening, uh, toward relating to other people and finding out who they are so that we can uh, love them more deeply. And maybe we can even discover something about ourselves in, in our reflection in that. So um, thank you for being here today, for giving yourself uh, to this time of exploring diversity and the way that we live and love together. And uh, we're grateful that Fran and, and Marlon are here to uh, 
uh, share their expertise and their insights with us. Thank you so much. That was so powerful. At this time, we want to um, invite our guest speakers, but we are going to give you a little bio of them. So, Good afternoon, everyone. Marlon Brown is a man with over 10 years of professional experience working in equity and social justice. As a King County Certified Equity and Social Justice Practitioner, Marlon specializes in leadership, coaching, facilitation, training, and organizational development with an emphasis on equity and customer service. Marlon is very skilled and experienced in change agent mentoring, racial caucusing, and policy development implementation, as well as creating and advising equity committee teams and developing anti-racist curriculum. Marlon develops lasting relationships with staff and leadership, unionized and at will workforces. Relationships are vital to change work in any capacity. Marlon's ability to coach clients developing better relationships with their coworkers and teammates allows for a greater impact. Oh. And uh, also Fran Partridge. <laughs> She's a woman with 20 years of racial equity experience, specifically in instructional leadership, educational practices, and educational policy change. Most of Fran's work has been with the educational system as a teacher, instructional coach, and mentor, as well as an equity and race relations specialist with Seattle Public Schools. She has facilitated over 300 professional development sessions focused on historic and systematic racism, implicit bias, racial identity, microaggressions, and cultural responsive instruction. Fran is co-founder of Racial Equity Consultants, LLC, and has experience co-developing strategic planning for racial equity work analyzing data, developing assessment tools, providing guidance, and designing and facilitating high-quality, culturally responsive professional development based on adult learning principles. She holds a master's degree in education policy and administration. We are blessed to have them with us today. Thank you so much uh, for having us here. Um, I just want to kind of dive in and get moving uh, as the, 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 the clock is ticking. <laughs> so um, I am Marlon Brown uh, with Racial Equity Consultants. I am um, also now a, a co-owner of, of the business. So um, we've been in existence for three years uh, and growing leaps and bounds. We have a number of uh, um, consultants that work with us uh, from time to time when we need uh, to do more projects uh, and, and that. Um, and we, um, we are, are, are striving to be um, and, and helping organizations become anti-racist organizations and really understanding what that means and all that that entails. And having conversations, um, whoop, just want to make sure I'm, you can hear me, um, and, just, and, and all that that entails and how we unpack the ways in which we've learned and been socialized um, to what we've inherited as far as history and that and so um, we we'll go through all, all of that um, in our in our business and so uh, a little more about me um, as the bio shared I started a lot of my work with King County um, I um, was an IT guy in King County but I also uh, grew a passion about uh, racial equity, what King County calls equity and social justice. And so I, I uh, was on the, one of the first equity teams. I became a trainer. I worked to um, develop, um, uh, incorporate the training from the city of Seattle to uh, the county. Uh, worked with elected officials and directors on what it looked like to operationalize equity in our workforces um, and worked with a gamut of people to really um, help people understand what it, what it was that we we're trying to achieve with racial equity and what does it really mean and who loses and who gains and, and all of the, the anxieties around that and then looked at policies and practices and moved the, the, the county forward in that work. 
And so that's a little bit about me, but I wear a whole lot of hats that we don't have enough time to go through. Um, but I'm very, very active in this work and um, really loving you know, the, the impact that we're having on organizations moving forward. Graham? Um, I'm Fran Partridge, and I'm going to hold this and see if it works better. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, say before we go very much further that um, we are sitting on um, Coast Tulalip land um, that uh, the tribes of whom are the Tulalip and the um, do you want no. Snohomish, the Snohomish, and the Tulalip, and that. Um, this land basically was stolen from those people so that we could be here today. So um, just acknowledging that there's been an erasure um, and a way that we have uh, discounted, pushed aside, left out a significant um, group of folks um, so that we could be here. Huh, uh, 200 years ago, 100% of the people on this land were um, indigenous, and today we in Seattle there's less than one percent people who are indigenous. Um, so just start to start to notice that in your lives, um, how we have done that erasure. Um, I, as it said, as um, uh, Loretta said earlier, um, I am based in education. And uh, so what we do uh, in Racial Equity Consultants is we really kind of do more uh, workshop because we understand that uh, adults, all of us actually, learn better when we are engaged with our own experience uh, with, and the content. So as we provide some information for you today, we're also going to ask you to talk. We're going to ask you to do some reflecting. Uh, we're going to ask you to really connect the information with what you already know about your um, work, about your life, about what you've already thought about this stuff already. Um, race and racism are not easy topics to talk about. You might feel a little uncomfortable today, but that's your growing edge. That's where we all learn a little bit. That's where we all start to push ourselves. And obviously today we're gonna just dip our toe into the information and we're not going to be going, uh, we're not going to be solving 400 years of institutionalized oppression. Um, so we're going to invite you to take some of the questions that you come out with today and push yourself further in the discussion about race and racism. <clears throat> so when we have this discussion, we always um, start with setting a sort of norms or the way that we hold this conversation in a group, uh, which is which is more, it was just difficult and um, more intentional than a lot of like meetings we go to, right? Or uh, presentations where you just listen. So today, um, before I actually run through this list of things that I want you to think about, I want you to, if you feel comfortable, close your eyes and imagine someone in your life who is beloved to you. Could be, a, could be a family member, could be a friend, a colleague, someone who you feel is beloved to you. And I want you to imagine when you first met that person. Might have been when they were born. Might have been when you were born. But when did you meet that person? And as you think about that, what happened next? What were the celebrations you had with that person? Ways that you marked milestones, ways that you celebrated holidays. What were the kinds of characteristics you brought to that situation? What were the behaviors you brought to that situation that encouraged the relationship? And then, Think of the times when it was difficult, when there were challenges, you might have had disagreements or arguments. And what kind of characteristics did you have to bring to that situation? What were the parts of yourself that you had to bring to that situation to get through the conflict with that person 
so that they are now still beloved to you. I want you to grab onto those behaviors and characteristics and bring them into the room with you right now. Because those are the behaviors and characteristics that we want to use when we engage in this conversation. Because if you look like me, if you're white, you walk through the world white, you have not talked about race and racism very much unless you're involved in the work deeply. So we need to really bring ourselves these pieces, these characteristics into the room to be able to have this conversation. Who can yell out one of those behaviors or characteristics? Just yell it out. Patience. Patience, thank you. Acceptance. Acceptance, thank you. Respect. Respect, thank you. Love. Compassion, thank you. Love, Love. Love. thank you. Self-reflection. Self-reflection, thank you. Empathy, compassion. So those are the ways that we want to appear in this room in the next half hour, next 45 minutes. Yeah. So part of that is staying engaged. Part of it is using I statements in terms of we're talking about our own stories, nobody else's stories. We're talking about our own experience. We're listening to other people's stories with understanding. We're experiencing discomfort. I talked about that a little bit earlier. That's that piece of like, this is not an easy conversation. Can't pretend it is. So lean into it. It's a difficult conversation. It's going to be a little bit challenging. That's okay. That's good. The more we have it, the easier it gets. Center people of color and marginalized experience. POC means people of color. It's a political term. It combines people who have been oppressed and um, marginalized in our society to be a political force in our society. And what we mean by that is that there are a lot of groups of people who are marginalized, who are pushed to the side, who are left out in our um, institutions, in our society, um, LGBTQ, you know, women, um, people who are differently abled, right? But we are going to center people of color because people of color are in all of those identity groups too. Right? So we're going to start with people of color, we're going to start with race and racism, that's why we do this work. Um, accepting and expecting non-closure. As I said before, 400 years of historical racial oppression, we're not going to solve in 20 minutes or whatever we have now, now left. Um, but we're going to just tip, tip our toe into it and hopefully you'll come out with some questions and dive in as you walk out of the room. <laughs> Staying aware of intent versus impact, this is huge. Um, especially as we talk about this subject in healthcare, where the outcomes are so disparate. They're disparate in every institution in this country, in education, in our judicial system, and in healthcare. Okay? So really try and understand that we all, obviously, in this room, have incredibly fabulous intentions. We want to help people. We want to support people. We want to do the best we can. But sometimes our impact is not what we intend, right? Does anybody have this, had this experience with um, their beloved, for instance, where, you know, you said something, you did something, you thought it was good, you thought it was the right thing, by it. And you're like, what? But I didn't mean it that way. But you need to notice the harm, notice the impact, and be like, I am so sorry. I will figure out how to do that better and not have that harmful impact on you as we move forward. So paying attention to impact is so important in this work, right? Because as an institution, as a society, we have had a negative impact on people of color across the board. So thinking historically and staying in the USA, uh, we often try and talk about what's happening in the rest of the world. If we're going to solve anything here in the USA, if we're going to have any, um, if any change is going to happen, we are going to need to focus on our history and how we uh, have come to the place that we are. How the context in which we live is very informed by our history, our very specific history in this United States. 
So we're going to do that. And then um, asking permission. So you're going to be telling each other some stories today. You're going to be talking about how this stuff uh, shows up in your work. And you're going to hear each other's um, information. And you're going to go out of this room with content information, but please leave the stories and the people who told them in the room. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so as we begin, we should take a moment. There's pens and paper at your table. And I want you to write down what you know is the definition of race. So your sentence should start, race is, finish the sentence. Just write down your definition of race. Okay, so you've written down the definition that you have in your head about race. And I'm gonna tell you that usually in a room this size, at least half of you, if not more, will have written down that race is biological. A race is not biological. Race is a social, political construct that was created at the beginning of this country, before the beginning. It was created in the um, 1600s to implement racism. Ta-Nehisi Coates says, racism is actually the father of race, right? So we have been taught, and especially in the medical field, because I have a father who was a physician, <laughs> and I have a niece who is in medical school, so I know that you've been taught that race is biological. Because you want to say, oh, well, this group is, um, is, has propensity to this disease, and this group has propensity to this disease. And the fact is that those propensities don't come from the fact that they have a racial um, uh, component. The fact is that they may have an ethnic component. It may be because they're from a part of the country, or the part of the world, like malaria, I mean, like um, sickle cell anemia, that is related to where malaria exists, or it may be because they're, um, they have an experience with racism in the world that is so stressful that particular diseases form out of that stress, but it's not because of their race. Does that make sense? So race, in fact, people in West Africa their DNA is more similar to people in Western Europe than it is to people in East Africa. We would call people in all of Africa having the same race. When they come here, they do, <laughs> in this country. But, people with, but their DNA is not similar. In fact, people in the same, what we would call a racial category, tend to have much more fluidity around their difference in DNA than people that look differently or are, um, we would categorize it in different races. So that's a huge piece, right? Because we make tons of assumptions when we look at someone and we say, oh, they're that race and therefore they have these characteristics and that behavior and this experience, blah, 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 blah. okay? So we need to really switch that mentality to be like, actually, we can't determine anything based just on somebody's race or their appearance. Right? We can't make those judgments and assumptions. And I will tell you that we do it all the time. That's how our brains work. But we have to start interrupting that process. Okay? So we know that um, we have too close. Uh, we have inherited 40 years of history um, that has developed a, a series of systems that we navigate through. And I just want to acknowledge that uh, the history we have inherited is not a result of what we've done. But we do have this opportunity to make a difference, to do something different, so that going forward, you know, we don't continue to do the things that's been done in the past. And that's this great opportunity we're here uh, now. So um, the video that we're uh, preparing to share uh, is a um, researcher 
who's, um, who wants to highlight um, the difference in um, healthcare outcomes for people of color versus uh, white people. Joining us now to detail how discrimination affects a person's health and well-being is David Williams, sociologist at Harvard University. Hello, thank you for coming on to the program. Thank you, it's good to be here with you. You're here in Toronto delivering a lecture called Race and Health, a healthy future for us all. Yes. How is, how is race a public health issue? Race is a public health issue because your race in most countries of the world predicts how long and how well you will live. So depending on what race you are, we can say something powerfully about the quality of your life, the length of your life, and how good your health will be. Okay, let's look at some numbers uh, of life expectancy of blacks and whites in the U.S. to give our viewers a, a snapshot of the disparity, at least in that country. Okay, we all know uh, women live longer than men, despite their race, mm -hmm. about into their late 70s, early 80s. The real gap here um, is with men. White men right now are living to their mid-70s, black men just below 70. What do you infer from those numbers? Um, I inf those numbers remind us of a trend that has existed from the earliest health data in the United States, and that is that whites live longer than blacks. And although the good news is that life expectancy for both whites and blacks have increased over time, and we've had some narrowing of the health gap, we still have the persistence of that racial gap in health. And importantly, it reflects the fact that we still have the persistence of social inequalities, Race is in part a proxy for social inequality in society. Uh, from that chart, life expectancy for black women still higher than white men. What's that about? Black women have made progress over time. There is a racial gap in health. There's also a gender gap in health. So black women are disadvantaged compared to white women, but they do slightly better than white males. Scientists determined um, a long time ago that, that race is, is a social construct rather than, than a, a biological category. So how can there be a, a different life expectancy then for blacks and whites? That's a really good question. I, I like to think of it this way. The fact that you and I know what race we belong to tells us more about our society than about our biological makeup. Because race is not capturing much about biological distinctiveness. The superficial external characteristics that, that race reflects doesn't have much to do with whether we get sick or not. Whether we get sick or not has to do with the opportunities to be healthy in the places where we spend most of our time. Our homes, our communities, um, our workplaces, and race in most societies reflects differential access to the desirable goods and resources in a society. So basically what I'm saying is, blacks and other disadvantaged groups in the United States, like American Indians and increasingly uh, Hispanic uh, uh, populations um, and Pacific Islanders have worse health than whites because they tend to live in poorer neighborhoods, because they have higher levels of stress, and the stress linked to racism is one type of stress we can talk more about. Um, but in general, they, they have lower levels of income, they have jobs where they have higher levels of, of negative occupational exposures. So as you go across every domain of life, they are socially disadvantaged and our bodies keep track and keep a record of all the negative exposures that we have and so we have racial differences in health and in life expectancy. So disparities caused by socioeconomic status? Disparities caused by larger so social inequalities including socioeconomic status, absolutely. Okay, we often talk about, you know, um, outcomes based, based on demographics like middle class family, for yes. example, how they do. So should a black or Latino middle-class family expect to have the same uh, health outcomes as a white middle-class family? That's a really good question. When I started my academic career and research in this area some 25 years ago, most researchers believed that the racial differences simply reflected differences in income, education, and occupation. And if you compared blacks and whites at the same level of income and wealth and education, there would be no racial difference. What we now know is that yes, there are large gaps in health by education. So middle-class blacks do a lot better and live a lot longer than poor blacks. Mm -hmm. 
but at every level of income and education, blacks still have poor health. So in addition to the standard risk factors linked to education and income, there is something else about race that matters. And I have been doing work trying to unpack what else it is about race and what are the ways in which the experience of being black in a society has consequences for health. So just to be clear, the, that same black middle class family, mm -hmm. higher healthy outcomes than a poor white family? Um, in, in some analyses, yes. But remember, at every level of income and education, that a uh, white person is doing better than a black person with the same level of, of education as he or she has. Okay, what do you attribute that to? So we, we, are, we are trying to understand what else it is about race, and I think we think it's, it's, it's three things. Number one, if you look at a college-educated black person today, so their social status is high, but a college-educated black person today is more likely to have been born poor, more likely to have experienced deficits in access to good nutrition and access to good medical care in early childhood. Higher levels of what we call early childhood adversities, the toxic stressors in childhood. And our bodies keep a record of all our lifetime exposures so that even if today you are high status, you still suffer for some of the earlier life exposures. So that's number one. You've, we've got to take a life course perspective into account. Secondly, in the United States, all the indicators of socioeconomic status are not equivalent across race. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you look at, on average, a level of education, at the same level of education, whites earn more income than blacks. And on average, income in the hands of a white person buys more goods and services than in the hands of a black person. And that may sound really crazy, because on average, blacks live in worse places. But the cost of goods and services are higher. The, the rent per square foot is higher. The cost of insurance is higher. The cost of a lot of goods and services are higher in the poor places where blacks and Hispanics are more likely to live. So you, they don't get as much purchasing power of income. And at every level of income, at similar levels of income, whites have greater wealth than blacks. And, you know, income is the flow of resources into the household. Wealth is the economic reserves that blacks have. So that's the second issue that even though we're saying they are equivalent, they're not really equivalent. But thirdly, and, and most importantly, I think, for our conversation, the R word. Racism still matters for health in multiple ways. Well, as you say, it, the, there are a, a range of reasons yes. of why these health disparities exist. Absolutely. So I want to pick up on the third one. Okay. The R word, as you said. Yes. How can you be certain that it's racism? That is very good question. We, racism operates in multiple ways. Um, there are scholars who have studied racism over time. So I'll give you one example of racism that most people don't even think about. Racism operates through institutional mechanisms. And what we mean by that, it's not what any individual person does. There's no, no action on the part of an individual person, but there are policies and procedures that can, could have been put in place 50 years ago, 100 years ago, that still have consequences. In the United States, we have a very powerful one. It's called residential segregation. In the early 20th century, uh, the United States society, American society, developed policies to separate blacks from whites in terms of the areas where they could live. It was the law of the land. It was supported by the banks and by realty agencies and everyone had bought into this differences. Well, it's no longer the law of the land. It's been ruled illegal by the Supreme Court in the 1960s. But still, Americans today are just slightly less segregated than blacks in South Africa were on the legally mandated apartheid. So although it's no longer the law, the custom has maintained these differences in living circumstances. And where you live in the United States determines what school you go to. It determines your access to employment opportunity. It determines the quality of housing you have. It determines whether your neighborhood is a healthy community or an unhealthy one. It even determines your access to high quality medical care. 
So in the U.S., we now say that your zip code, or in the U Canada, we see the postal code. <laughs> we call it zip code in the United States. Your zip code is a stronger predictor of how long and how well you live than your genetic code. You mentioned postal codes in Canada. Your data is born out of the, the U.S. Yes. Do you have a sense of how these racial uh, differences in health play out here in Canada? We, we do. Um, there are Canadian researchers who have been studying. I think there's been less focus in Canada on, on the race variable, but there are Canadian researchers who have been studying race in Canada and are finding uh, similar patterns to what we find in the United States. Particularly, there's been researchers looking at discrimination, the subjective experience of discrimination as one type of stressful life experience that has health consequences. You um, uh, talked a little bit about the makeup of residential um, situation in yes. the U.S. today. Uh, I, I just want to sort of talk about the story behind the numbers. Yes. I, I know things are still slightly the same, but things have changed over the things past have three or four decades. So how has the situation changed? It's improved? Y yes. There, there are lower levels of segregation today than there was in 1960, 1970, 1980, every census suggests the levels are, are getting lower. However, most of the decline in segregation refers to the fact that there's now one or two black families living in a census tract that used to be all white. But the fundamental structure of the concentration of poverty of blacks in, in, in particular areas of cities and the concentration of poverty and all of the urban ills that go with that, that structure has not changed much so, in recent years. So the disparities in health haven't changed in, in three the, to four decades in the general? The disparities in health have become slightly smaller, but they're still large. Let me explain to you just how big the disparities are. Imagine a fully loaded jumbo jet with 265 passengers and crew taking off from the Toronto airport okay. and everybody on board dying. And that happened today and tomorrow and every day next week and every day next month and every day for a year. That's what we talk about when we say there are black-white differences in health in the United States. 265 black people die prematurely every single day in the United States. So these are huge differences that, that we cannot just accept when there is a lot that we can do <clears throat> to change the playing field and to create opportunity for better health for all. We'll talk about what we can do, but, but I do want to ask you, in terms of health treatments, uh, is discrimination manifest in those terms as well? Absolutely. Um, between 2000 and 2002, I served <clears throat> on a panel for the Institute of Medicine. It's the highest scientific medical authority in the United States. And the United States Congress had voted to ask the Institute of Medicine to answer a simple question. And this was the question. When blacks and other minorities enter healthcare context in the United States, does their race determine whether or not they get uh, good quality medical care? And the report was issued in 2002. And what we found, that virtually across every single area of medicine, blacks receive and other minorities receive poorer quality of care than whites do. I, I thought Let me give you an example. supposed to be colorblind. It, it, it is, and, and, but, but it's complicated. Our, our health care providers are part of our society. They, they were raised in the society, and they have been fed the same cultural racism that is so deeply embedded in society. Let me give you an, an example of the kinds of differences we find. Dr. Todd was an emergency room physician at UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles, and he asked a simple question. When a patient comes into the UCLA emergency room with a broken bone in the arm or legs, does the patient's race determine how, whether they get pain medication or not? And he found that 25% of white patients in the past year had gotten no pain medication compared to over 50% of Hispanic patients had gotten no pain medication. Dr. Todd was a good researcher. He said there must be something else. So he statistically took into account what time the patient came to the ER, how long they spent in the emergency room, whether they got injured on the job or not, whether they spoke English or not, virtually every other social demographic factor. And the strongest predictor of whether a patient got pain medication was the patient being Hispanic. Dr. Todd moved to Atlanta to Emory University, repeated the same study at emergency rooms in Atlanta and found a black patient going to the emergency room with a broken bone in the arm or leg 
is less likely to get pain medication than a white patient. And that's just one example of a pervasive pattern across every single area of medicine. Okay, help me understand that though, because yes. it is hard to imagine that a doctor would look at someone and say, black man with broken leg, white man with broken leg, you white person will get pain medication, you black person, maybe sometimes, but probably not. How, how does that happen? That is correct. What we offered as a the best explanation for this phenomenon, for which today we have good hard evidence, is a phenomenon that social psychologists have been studying for three or four decades. It's called unconscious or unthinking bias or discrimination based on negative stereotypes. And this is what the research shows. And by the way, I want to emphasize, this is not about American doctors. This is not about Americans. This is not about white people. It's about how all human beings process information. If I hold a negative stereotype about a group and I meet someone from that group, my next two words are important. It's automatic and it's unconscious. I do it, I don't know that I do it, I will treat that person differently, that is, I will discriminate against that person and I, there was no intent on my part, there was no hostility on my so part. So the negative There's, stereotype is not an individual decision. It's not an individual decision. It's based on these negative images in your mind for that group. And it's not just about race. If you have negative stereotypes about gay people, about fat people, about old people, and you meet someone from that group, you will treat them differently in a broad range of social contexts in society. And the ER is no different. And the ER is no different, and physicians and other healthcare providers are parts of the societies in which they, they, they were raised. All right. Broaden this out for me. What are the economic costs associated with racial disparities in health? The economic costs associated with racial disparities in health are substantial. A study was done um, about two years ago that suggested that racial inequalities in health cost the U.S. economy three hundred and ten billion dollars a year and that is both the additional cost of treating illness one and even the bigger cost was lost productivity when people are sick and not able to work when people are dying prematurely we are losing that level of economic productivity in other words what i'm saying is that racial inequalities in health literally hurt the productiveness of the American population and hurts America's economic competitiveness on a global level. So it's an important issue to address, not only for the wonderful humanitarian reasons of giving everyone the best possible life they would have, but also for the national reasons of having the best workforce and the most productive uh, workforce that you can have. Okay, you provide us with the data, mm -hmm. the evidence, the big question, of course, then is what do you do about it? What do you suggest health authorities, other uh, uh, governments, other authorities do to address this problem that exists, as, as you argue, not just in the United States, but in almost every country in the world? There is a lot that can be done. Remember I said that the determinants of health are primarily driven by the opportunities to be healthy in the places where we live, learn, work, play, and worship. And that means no one sector of society has the answers. We all need to work together to create a culture of good health, a culture that promotes better health in our schools, that encourages our kids to be active, that promotes good nutrition. We need in our neighborhoods to, to break the linkage between the minority composition of the neighborhood and exposure to violent crime and access to employment opportunities and access to safe places to walk and access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So there's a lot that we can do for healthcare providers we need to raise awareness levels that there are these human processes that occur and that you would naturally uh, treat someone differently. The, the biggest strategy for healthcare providers is to be aware that that could be me. I could actually discriminate against social groups that I am not a part of without any intent on my part. And that awareness can facilitate a number of strategies that healthcare providers can do to minimize engaging in such behavior. What about universal health care? Would that help? Universal health care would help. It's, it's not a magic bullet. Um, as health care in most Western societies is not heavily focused on prevention, so that it functions to a large degree 
as a repair shop, taking care of us once we get sick, but not being a driver of whether we got sick or not in the first place. There are preventive strategies, and I'm kind of generalizing, but by and large, our healthcare system is not focused on prevention. On the other hand, there are disparities not only in getting sick, but once individuals get sick, how long you live, what's the quality of your life, what's your level of impairment, are all a function of good quality health care. So providing universal access to care is one important step, one foundation building block to everything that we need to do to improve health. You hopeful that we can turn this around, change it? I am absolutely hopeful. There is, um, my, my presence here reflects a conversation in this country about these issues and across the world and in multiple countries there are more people paying attention to these issues and I think we are all people of goodwill. Uh, I think most people are shocked to hear of the kinds of statistics we are talking about and I think we need to provide the tools that particularly policymakers can make so that they can bring a focus of health into all policies and take the steps that are needed to provide better health for all. David Williams, appreciate your time. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. It's good to be with you. All right. So having seen that and understanding that race is actually not biological, it's a social political construct, you remember he said we pay attention to three social aspects of a person, very social political aspects. Thank you. Um, and so what you're going to do is you're going to think to yourself, understanding all this now or knowing this or being told this, where have I seen this? in my work, either by other people or maybe your own self, or maybe you experienced it. And what can you do to eliminate health disparities, meaning what can you do to interrupt that bias or that discriminatory unconscious that resides in your head? Yeah, and in the other um, video that we're going to share, um, Dr. Williams also shares that um, experiences uh, with people of color and white people, there was a gap even when education and um, economics were the same. So a middle class family, a uh, white family, and a middle class black family um, with the same level of education, the gap still existed in their outcomes and their experiences. So um, even when you level out all of the other factors, race still played a part because of these implicit and, and, and these stereotypes and biases that are in play that's never, never been really checked, checked and, and, and made conscious to people. So um, the more that we are conscious of that, the more that we, we remind ourselves that, you know, hey, you know, I've learned a certain thing about, uh, about people. I need to really be conscious of that when it comes to how I interact with them. And, and, and if my goal is that everyone has great uh, experiences with me and with our services, then we have to be conscious of that uh, going into the room. Okay. So uh, let's, at your tables, let's begin to talk about these two questions. Where have you seen or experienced the health gap in your work and ways in which you can um, leave here interrupting um, those patterns, interrupting and being conscious of the experiences of the people who you're interacting with, whether it is your coworkers and uh, uh, providers, or if, if it's actually the patients themselves. Okay, let's take a few minutes to have that conversation at your table. Is going to is there anyone who would like to share out what they shared to the table about how they've seen this show up in their work? Or, if you've gotten that far, how um, you plan to interrupt uh, this going back into your workspaces? Anyone want to share? How when they, um, a, a caregiver that's a different race or their skin tone is different, they would say, I don't want that person in the room with me. Uh, tell them to go back where they came from. It was a particular nurse. And uh, the person that said that had some developmental delays and they were tiptoeing around this person. And um, the person went to the charge nurse and talked to them and said, you know, that's not okay. And, 
and try to go back to the person and say, you know, this is your caregiver, you're here at the hospital, we're here to help you, and that kind of behavior is not acceptable and will not be tolerated. No? <coughs> I'm not a caregiver, but the people in my group were talking about when someone comes in and they speak a different language and there's a language gap, and um, we were talking about this whole, when someone comes in and they speak like you and they use the same vocabulary as you and they're asking lots of questions to advocate for themselves and get information, that makes it really easy to give more intensive care and better care, but it's almost like you have to imagine and empathize like, okay, just because they're not asking the questions doesn't mean I can't try to communicate this stuff to them. Anyone else? It's my personal opinion, but I think if you say to yourself, I don't do that, you're wrong. And that's your first step is to figure out how you're doing it, when you're doing it, and to change it. And unfortunately, a lot of people my generation, well, without even knowing it, were, were raised incredibly racist, racist. And it's so hard to ferret that out and catch yourself, but you've got to. and you. If you think you're not doing it, you're doing it. Okay. Yeah, and you know, we as a society struggle with that good bad binary. Um, you know, we all have intentions to be very good and to mean well and to do our absolute best for what we have. Um, so, you know, it's a practice. It's a practice of really being conscious of how you show up what your responses are, what, what that reflex is to do X versus Y, and, and, and become conscious of that. And then, um, eventually, we'll get to a place where maybe, <laughs> as coworkers and co-laborers with each other, um, be able to identify those situations with each other and then have conversations to say, hey, ooh, hey, I noticed that when patient X was in a room that you did this. You know, how can we talk about that in a way that isn't, you know, doesn't have to be defensive, but that we, you know, lovingly with each other, you know, focus on the outcomes and the care that we're providing for our patients and, 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 and their families even. You know, um, having that conversation and, and, and being that resource and support to each other is ultimately where we're trying to go because you don't necessarily have to do this in a vacuum. You don't have to do it in isolation. And the more that we begin to be, uh, one, build our relationship with each other to be very honest as we're going through this and really understanding and unpacking that, the better we feel about, you know, just being honest with ourselves and honest about, you know, our journeys as we're going forward. So if we're building that relationship with each other, we're building that honesty, we're building that opportunity to be challenged and to say, and take responsibility for, hey, you know, I didn't know that, and I thank you so much for acknowledging that. I will do my work to, you know, not not do that anymore, I'd be, I, and even ask myself why. Why do I do that? Why in that situation is it is it you know nervousness? Is it this or that? Or is it in fact the way I've been socialized and I've been taught that you know X people do this and I should you know do Y? So you know, but this is the beginning. This is how we are developing. This is how we. Uh, race rapid consultants, you know, really push that conversation and to help folks build relationships with each other to support each other because you, you just can't do it alone. And oftentimes we're, you know, told that, you know, you need to do it on your own and that kind of thing. But in fact, we actually need each other to, to support each other and to, you know, hold us accountable in the work. All right. Are we out of time? Yeah. It goes so fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you so much. <laughs>